books authored by our faculty that many of us have contributed to in some capacity, either as researchers, academic support, or colleagues. So it's really great to have uh, both co-authors here today, and I'm going to give a very brief introduction um, of them, to, and so that we have most of the time left for them to talk about their work. And of course, I cannot begin to do justice to their breadth of scholarship and activities. They somehow find time for both of these. Um, they're both incredibly prolific and influential scholars and generous colleagues and longtime collaborators as well. Karen J. Alter is the professor of political science and law at Northwestern University and co-director of the research group on global capitalism and law at the Buffett Institute at Northwestern. Um, Alter's current research investigates the legalization and judicialization of international relations in Europe, Africa, Latin America, and Latin America with respect to economic, human rights, and mass atrocities. Winner of the Berlin Prize and, Guggenheim, and a Guggenheim Fellow, she has written extensively in the areas of politics and international politics of international law comparative international courts and international regime complexity. She is a member of the New York Council on Foreign Relations and serves on the editorial boards of many leading journals, including the American Journal of International Law and International Studies Review. And that's just the brief introduction. So, um, and our own Lawrence Helfer is the Harry R. Chadwick Senior Professor of Law and is an expert in the areas of international law and institutions, international adjudication and dispute settlement, human rights, including LGBT rights, and international intellectual property law and policy. Professor Helfer has co-authored three books and more than 70 scholarly articles and also lectured widely on his diverse research interests relating to the interdisciplinary analysis of international laws and institutions. He is co-director of the Duke Law's Center for International and Comparative Law and a senior fellow with Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics. He is also a member of the board of editors of the American Journal of International Law and the Journal of World Intellectual Property. Both of our speakers are also permanent visiting professors at I-Courts, the Center for, of Excellence for International Courts at the University of Copenhagen. So with that introduction, I look forward to your time. So thank you all for coming. It's great to see such a great turnout of uh, colleagues and uh, students and friends. So I'm really uh, delighted. Um, Professor Alter and I are going to uh, go back and forth as we talk about our uh, project, um, which is the culmination of a decade of collaborative research together, um, not just on uh, the Andean Tribunal of Justice, one of the transplanted international courts we'll talk about, but other uh, international judicial institutions in other parts of the world as well. Um, and I thought I would get us started with a, 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 just a short anecdote. Um, uh, Karen and I had been sort of tracking each other, but not actually having really met. Um, we were kind of reading each other's work, citing each other's work, and it was kind of faded that we would, you know, at some point get together and, and do something interesting. Um, and I remember the day when this collaboration started, so for those of you um, who know some of my work, uh, I, I do work in the area of intellectual property as well as public international law and human rights. And I remember very clearly the call that I got from Karen one morning. She said, what do you know about the Andean Tribunal of Justice? And I said, well, I know it exists, which is probably better than 99% of the people you probably could ask that question to. So I said, why? Is it doing anything? And she said, well, actually, yes, um, it's issued some, I think then 1,200 rulings, something like that. And I said, oh my gosh, I didn't know anything about that. She said, well, the European Union just gave some money to the Andean uh, community to put the rulings online, and I've started to look at them systematically to code them and read them. Uh, they're uh, in Spanish only, so that was part of it, partially a challenge. Uh, and I said, oh, well, what are, what are these about? So this court is kind of modeled on the European Court of Justice, which is one of the most powerful and successful courts in the world, as Professor Alter will describe in a moment. Um, and she said, well, that's why I'm calling you. She said, they all seem to be about patents and trademarks. And I was like, what? Why? How is that possible? She said, well, I don't 
really know. I have been down already to speak to some of the judges, and I'm trying to figure out this legal system. And there's lots of details about intellectual property law. So do you want to think about collaborating on this? So fast forward 10 years later, uh, after multiple trips to the region, what Karen has really convinced me about, uh, and, and it's been a real revolution for me, has been the only way to learn about the kinds of institutions we study is not just to read their output or look at the foundational documents. Of course you want to do that, but you have to go and you have to spend time and you have to talk to the litigants and the judges and the government officials and the attorneys and the business associations to really understand how a system works. So our collaboration that you'll hear about here is very much a mixed method project and it's very much based on our field research as well as our um, uh, doctrinal and coding research. So it's very much a marriage of law and political science and a marriage of, I hope, what are different and complementary approaches. So I'm going to turn over to Karen to, to uh, talk about um, two key questions, which I hope will interest you in this tribunal for its own sake and for what it says about international adjudication more broadly. So this collaboration with Larry has been one of the joys of my professional life. I really encourage you to find someone you can have so much fun collaborating with. And everything we do is, I think, better than what we would do if we did it on our own. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I want to talk about why I'm studying the Indian Tribunal. We're studying it. Because it's interesting in its own right. It's got these weird, quirky things. But it's actually really theoretically interesting. That's why we're studying the Indian Tribunal. And then we'll give you some key lessons that we've learned by studying this tribunal. So I found the Indian Tribunal when I was working on my book, The New Train of International Law. And that book is a, what I call a bird's eye view. I'm like 20,000 miles above looking at the entire universe of international courts and trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And I discovered the Indian Tribunal, which is the third most active international court. You have the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Justice, and then you have this Andean Tribunal, which when you think about it, the International Court of Justice is older. The WTO has every country in it. And there are thousands of rulings of this Andean Tribunal and only hundreds of rulings from the International Court of Justice and the World Trade Organization. So it's not that I think that rulings make a court more influential, but I think that lawyers don't waste their time. And if there's litigation going on there, it must be because it's in some way worthwhile. And so then the puzzle becomes to figure out why it's worthwhile. So the Indian Tribunal is a tribunal for these four countries. When we started the research, Venezuela was also, um, they, they had just left, but most of the cases we look at, Venezuela was also in the Indian Tribunal. Um, it is the oldest international court operating outside of Europe. It's the third most active court of the 24 operational international courts worldwide. When we started to do this research, it was when Chavez was there causing chaos in all of Latin America. Um, and so it was a challenging political context. And we could see, the more we did the research, it was very clear that the Indian Tribunal was very effective in terms of intellectual property, effective in ways that people took for granted. So when you would interview the lawyers, you would say, well, if, you're, if your patent is violated, can you bring the case to court? And they'd say, well, yeah, of course you can. And can you get a ruling that is uh, helpful? Oh, yes, you can. And can you enforce that ruling? Oh, yes, you can. So it functions just like you would expect any legal system to function, but only with respect to intellectual property, not with customs, not with taxes, not with free movement of goods. And so that became a real puzzle to figure out how they made this so effective in intellectual property and why it doesn't work for any other issue area. But then it also became an opportunity for us to revisit our scholarship. So my first two books were on the European Court of Justice. And I definitely went down to the Indian context thinking with the European Court in my mind. And Larry's work has been more in the European Court of Human Rights. And he had written on what makes supranational courts effective. And it's if they have uh, private access and compulsory jurisdiction in a lot of cases so they can develop the law. So we had all of these assumptions going down there. I thought it must be that national courts are the main partners. Look, there are all these preliminary ruling cases, cases that are referred from national courts to the Indian Tribunal. That's exactly how the European Court of Justice built its authority. And so we had these roadmaps in our head of what we expected to find, which turned out not to be true, uh, or not to be exactly what we thought they were going to be. And I thought, as I'm doing this 20,000 20, feet above, looking at all these international courts, this real deep dive into the Andean Tribunal would give me the balance to help me think about 
what was going on in these other regions. Because um, most of these international courts are in developing country contexts. I also, it, it's true as Larry said that this is a direct copy of the European Court of Justice, but there are actually 11 direct copies of the European Court of Justice. So um, I'm going to tell you in a minute that the Andean Tribunal is by far the most successful of these copies. But then I could see that studying the Andean Tribunal could help me understand how transplants work differently than the progenitor and why the Andean Tribunal is um, so successful when it's a transplant. All of these courts have the design criteria that we would expect are required for effective courts. They have private access, they have preliminary ruling mechanisms, they have community law that's directly effective, they have non-compliance procedures. And so it was a theoretically rich case to study because it's one of 11 copies. And most of these copies are in developing country context. So, that, so the Benelux and the European Free Trade are in Europe, but everyone else is in uh, either Africa or Latin America. So we could start to see how context shapes the way that international courts operate. So that's why we were interested in the Indian Tribunal. But also, it is in a developing country context. And as the research progressed, we realized both of us came from studying Europe and the United States, where the legal systems functions very well. And so we had to get it, wrap our head around what it meant to be a court that's operating in a developing country context. And these are some of the things that we found. First, the politics are dominated by executives in Latin America and in many, in most developing country contexts. They have the formal institutions of democracy, but it's really executive politics that dominate. Development and stability are constant challenges for these systems. They're, they're constantly trying to develop and maintain political stability. And th that just matters a whole heck of a lot more than regional integration. So in Europe, the regional integration process has been the, a very top priority of countries. It's a way to avoid World War III. Um, it's a way to make the countries economically competitive. In developing country contexts, these regional projects are really low priorities. And they will always be supplemented to the goal of development and um, political stability. Also, national judges in the domestic rule of law are weak. And they're also really um, precarious. So over the course of time that we're studying, um, the judiciaries in uh, Ecuador and in Venezuela are totally taken over by populism. In fact, my first set of interviews that I did in the Ecuadorian court, it was surreal because Ecuador had just fired the entire Supreme Court and everybody was ma manifesting on the streets, which is why the, the administrative judges had all this time to talk to me. But here you are trying to study this supranational court when the entire Supreme Court has just been fired. So how do you think about what's going on when the judiciary is so weak and unstable? Member states have vastly different populations, economies, sizes. So it's not even possible to think about applying the rule in the same way to every country. In the Andean context, Bolivia is so completely underdeveloped that um, it's always, and then there's Bolivia when you're talking to them. Also, the most important trading partners are not in the region. For the Andean community, it's the United States and uh, other Latin American countries, which is why they decided to integrate in the first place. and so. Opening up markets with each other is a low priority because that's not really central to their economy. Finally, economic and political turbulence are common. And these countries are going through major economic and political turbulence when they have to park on the side all of their commitments to Andean integration because they're getting bailed out by the International Monetary Fund. They're on the verge of revolution. Venezuela now is in revolution. So it's a very different context for an international court to try to establish its authority. But the Andean Tribunal is absolutely the most effective transplant. So now I've got to explain what we mean by it's the most effective transplant. So all of these European court copies have these same features. They're directly applicable community rules, which means that they don't have to be ratified first by national parliaments to become effective. And that's really important because national parliaments are really slow and behind in these countries. And if you had to wait for them to ratify the rules, it just wouldn't happen. Um, they all have preliminary ruling mechanisms, which allow private litigants to go to a domestic court and to ask the domestic judge to refer the case to the supranational court. Then the, case, the court issues a ruling, the case returns to the domestic court, and the domestic judge then applies the ruling to the case at hand, which means that every preliminary ruling case that is litigated will be implemented because it goes back to the national court to implement it. And so it's a great mechanism for international courts. You know that often 
Unfortunately, the United States will ignore courts of the International Court of Justice. Like it's almost, you have to take a next action to comply with a WTO decision, with an International Court of Justice decision. Not in preliminary ruling cases, because it goes right back to the domestic judge who then continues the proceeding, and it's always implemented. It might not be implemented correctly, but actually in the Andean context, it's always implemented, and it's always implemented correctly, because they're very narrow technical rulings. Uh, there's also a procedure, a non-compliance procedure. It's called, um, in the Andean community, in Europe, it's called the infringement procedure which allows the supranational secretariat to raise a non-compliance case directly with a member state and to bring it to the court. So someone at the secretariat is monitoring state compliance and bringing non-compliance cases to the court. Um, and there also are mechanisms to challenge the val validity, this is the third one, of Andean law. So if an Andean law is passed that is either not constitutional, a violation of the treaty, or if the Andean Secretariat does something that's not kosher, exceeds its authority, you can directly challenge these actions in front of the um, Andean court. Now, all of the ECJ transplants have these mechanisms. But only the Andean tribunals actually use all of these mechanisms. So why it's the most successful is it's more than three decades old, including major episodes of turbulence, like near wars between member states, economic collapses, and it's still going. It has an active and continuous stream of references from national courts. Of all of the transplants, this is the only one that has activated this preliminary ruling mechanisms. The rest exist on paper, but they don't actually exist in practice. Uh, as, as Larry's going to explain, it's actually very effective in the domain of intellectual property, and we'll explain what we mean by that. All of these four litigation access points are used, and they're used fairly regularly. And even though its jurisprudence is 94% of the cases have to do with intellectual property, um, it actually has, for a transplant, a number of cases that are not about intellectual property. It has 114 preliminary rulings and 113 non-compliance cases, most of which are about economic issues more generally. So it actually has been uh, activated for its economic jurisdiction. So these are the reasons why we think it's the most successful. So before I talk a bit about um, the intellectual property case law and the, the differences in the subject matter docket between the European Court of Justice and the Andean Tribunal, um, I just want to reemphasize something that Karen has already said. So this is not a, uh, a very uh, facilitating context in which an international court um, would be able to thrive. So we, we have a, a, a context in which um, the rule of law is weak, uh, executive branches are powerful, judiciaries are often politically penetrated. Um, we wouldn't have expected much from such a tribunal, and yet copied into that, transplanted into that situation is, are the features of a very successful tribunal, including certain design features like uh, the ones that, that uh, Karen just talked about on the left side of this slide. Uh, and the question then becomes, what happens when you transplant an institution from one legal and political context to a very different legal and political context, much less um, uh, conducive to building the uh, international rule of law? What, what actually happens there? Uh, and you could have a number of different prior um, suppositions about that. You could say, well, it's going to do nothing. Uh, you could think that it's just going to move off in a you know, completely different direction. Um, but how exactly it might do that? Is that was the puzzle that we wanted to explore. And uh, in particular, we wanted to explore where we started our exploration is in what we call the, the island of effective international adjudication for intellectual property disputes. And here you can see um, a breakdown of some of the cases. The reason why we divided these periods uh, the way we did is it reflects the sort of evolution of our research. We started out uh, looking at the origins of the tribunal through to 2007. And then over time, um, we went back to the region, and we saw actually that there were more cases. Uh, and so we studied then the period through uh, from 2008 to 2014. And you can see it's really quite stable. So the overwhelming majority of cases are about trademarks uh, and uh, patents and other forms of intellectual property with just 2% uh, in the early period and 6% in the later period dealing with such issues 
as uh, tariffs, customs, taxes, and environmental regulation. By the way, it's not that Andean law doesn't cover those topics. It does cover those topics. And just as in the European community, now the European Union, the breadth of secondary legislation, not as broad as in Europe, but really quite broad in the Andean context. And yet we have very few of these cases. So that's a puzzle. Why does IP work? Why is it a success, whereas other areas are not? And just to drive that home for you, um, what we, uh, another reason to sort of break out the cases the way we did is if you're going to compare two institutions, we had to set the time periods um, uh, of them into sync, if you will. So we wanted to look at the first quarter century of the European Court of Justice in comparison to the Andean Court. If you looked at them both at the same time, say in 2010, and said, well, look, the European Court's much more active, much more developed, much uh, more respect for its rulings, um, that really wouldn't be fair comparing it because it's much older than the Andean Tribunal. So when we look, though, at the first 25 years of the European Court of Justice in its preliminary rulings, you can see what a difference there is here, right? You can see that the topics that are covered are uh, vastly uh, uh, more diverse, right? And so it's during this same early 25-year period that we actually can see this, this uh, divergence. And so the question again was why, right? What caused the intellectual property cases to take off when the others didn't? Well, there are a couple of different answers to, to that story. And in order to talk a little bit about that, I wanted to give you one specific case, which I think is probably the most famous set of cases in, in the Andean legal system. Um, so, and that's the case involving uh, the second use patent for um, Viagra. Um, and just to preface that, I just want to say that the rules in the Andean community for intellectual property protection are Andean rules, right? They are, there is very little, there's some, but not much domestic intellectual property law. It's harmonized at the regional level. And when the Andean governments as developing countries were beginning to think about entering into the WTO and adhering to the, the, the trade related aspects of uh, intellectual property rights agreement that's part of the WTO, they said quite wisely, well, we're going to limit the extent to which we protect intellectual property in a way that's still consistent with the treaty. So they adopted what are known as a number of different flexibility mechanisms and other policy tools to limit protection. Uh, and they did that in a way for a variety of reasons, to keep the costs of new drugs down, to help keep their national health plans within you know, financially uh, manageable scope. Um, and one of the ways that they specifically did this in the area of pharmaceutical patents was to not allow a pharmaceutical company to patent a second use of a pharmaceutical that they later discover is, um, uh, ha has a, a, a new purpose that they would want to protect. So the story with uh, Viagra is that it was started out as a heart medication. And they found in the drug trials that uh, when they uh, gave this medication to the men, they did not bring back the extra pills. Uh, and then they asked why, <laughs> and I think you all know the answer. So Pfizer realized immediately it had a huge moneymaker on its hands, all over, not just in, uh, all over the world, potentially. And so they began to seek uh, second-use patents. They already had been a, a patent for, uh, for treatment of this particular um, heart ailment, but it was for the second use, for erectile dysfunction, where they knew the big money was to be made. And I think this helps us to understand the story of why intellectual property worked. Um, it, there had been, prior to uh, this case uh, coming down in uh, around uh, 2000, 2001, there had been already a series of uh, situations in which much more low profile, usually trademark disputes between private actors, uh, began to be litigated uh, at the agency level. So if you're filing an application for a patent or a trademark, you have to apply. It has to be registered. If there are uh, competitors who are interested in uh, preventing you from getting that registration, they have a right to be heard. And so in many of these lower profile cases, the administrative agencies began to apply uh, Andean IP law. And they began to ask uh, national judges to send cases, refer them through the preliminary ruling mechanism 
to the Andean Tribunal for a ruling on what was, after all, Andean law, a form of regional international law. So there already was the beginnings of a relationship. Uh, and in part, that relationship was driven by private businesses. In part, it was also driven by the local generics industry, which was uh, making uh, drugs uh, at a much lower price than uh, the patented equivalent. So when this case, um, when Pfizer begins to realize that, in fact, they have something tremendously lucrative, they uh, begin to pressure the government to uh, change Andean law. And at the time, uh, uh, Alberto Fujimori was in office, and he issued an executive decree uh, in allowing a second use patent. It didn't talk about Viagra, but it was very clear that Pfizer wanted that decree. There's some indication they actually wrote it, and uh, Fujimori simply adopted it. With that decree in hand, uh, they then go to uh, the agency, and they say, you have to register this patent. And the agency uh, says, well, we sort of think we have no choice, but we're really not happy about this. We think it violates Andean law. Uh, and through the normal course of the agency procedures, the Generic Drug Association in Peru found out about this, uh, opposed it, and convinced the uh, Andean uh, General Secretariat uh, to bring a case of noncompliance, which is the kind of cases Karen was mentioning earlier to bring this suit to challenge the decree and the second use patent. And uh, that case was uh, supported by the generics companies. It was um, supported by the administrative agencies. And the Andean court applied a very settled and clear rule of Andean law, no second use patents. And uh, the agencies then abrogated the patent. Now, here was something really fascinating. This decree, as far as we know, at least for a long time after it was issued, it remained on the books. But Pfizer could not get protection for Viagra, not only in Peru, but also in the other countries, because they were all governed by the same body of law. So what we found was compliance existed at the practical level, at the administrative state level, even where it didn't exist in national law. And that was really something that was uh, quite new. Um, now, I mentioned that uh, this noncompliance procedure was part of what triggered um, uh, the pushback against uh, efforts to expand IP protection. And I want to uh, talk a little bit now about uh, the broader context of um, the noncompliance cases. And what Karen and I did was break out uh, the uh, Andean uh, legal system into three periods. Now we're just looking at the 113 noncompliance cases, of which the Viagra case was one about around 2000. And you see a very striking pattern. So in the early days, there wasn't much in the way of noncompliance procedures at all. Uh, there wasn't really much political support from Andean officials uh, or others to push back against governments that were deviating from their obligations under Andean law. Um, during what we call the, the sort of heyday period, the period of the so-called Washington Consensus, when the governments in uh, the member states were aligned in favor of uh, market reforms, liberalization, free trade, although with you know, distinctive, some distinctive features for developing countries, uh, then they did something quite unique. They revised the design feature of the Andean legal system to allow litigants to bring cases directly to the Andean court alleging noncompliance. So what happened was the general secretariat, which screens these cases, was able to say to the governments, look, you know, if you don't settle this case or we can't come to a resolution, uh, the case is going to end up before the tribunal anyway. Uh, and so litigants recognizing uh, that this was a procedure that might actually be effective, during this period of strong support for Andean integration, you see uh, a rapid rise uh, in the use of this procedure, which again helped to instantiate uh, the Andean legal system uh, as one that had influence in a variety of different areas, including, of course, specifically intellectual property. Now, that period lasted only a decade. By 2006, Venezuela uh, is withdrawing. Uh, the other gov two other governments in the region, uh, in Bolivia and Ecuador, are moving much more to a a nationalist populist uh, government. Support for Andean integration declines. 
Uh, there are four member states left. They're too, too ideologically split, neoliberal on the one hand and nationalist populist on the other. And the support for Andean uh, litigation drops precipitously. So the member states are hamstrung. They're not able to do very much. Uh, the capacity of the legal affairs officers within the Andean General Secretariat is hollowed out the, through attrition and through putting in place um, political appointees who really aren't interested in Andean integration. Um, and so this drops off very precipitously. Now, what isn't on this chart, just a word about that, is it seemed like in uh, the 1915, excuse me, 2015 and 2016, there was uh, a flurry of additional activity when the Andean legal system uh, was in facing another crisis in Ecuador. And there, for reasons that I can talk about in Q&A, uh, there was a return to the Andean legal system to try to hold Ecuador to account for uh, its free trade obligations. What we don't have here yeah. is that at the same period of time, the, the preliminary ruling cases are pretty constant. It might even be going up. So we can see yes. this fluctuation in non-compliance cases, but preliminary ruling intellectual property cases Holding steady. Yeah. So the island continues. So when we did our most recent round of interviews in 2014, I think, 2015, uh, we found that Peru had created a specialized IP court uh, that was participating in the system. We found that the number of referrals from countries that hadn't referred many cases, Bolivia being the prime example, was going up. That the agencies themselves were now able, under a new interpretation of Andean law, to refer cases directly to the tribunal. So the island has continued to prosper even during the, this periods of, of political turbulence. Um, so just a few words about, again, to sum up about the questions that are addressed in this book. And I'll cover them briefly, because I want Karen to have plenty of time to talk about um, the lessons learned more broadly. Um, so how do you build effective an effective uh, adjudication in the IP island? It, in principal part, it's finding key allies. And the allies in this instance were uh, the domestic administrative agencies, which in turn were supported by the IP VAR, which in turn were able to build um, a, a kind of a technocratic rule of law within a particular area that survived uh, broader political challenges to the system overall. Um, one other way in which uh, we address questions is we looked, and I'll say more in Q&A if you want, about the doctrinal differences. The Andean Tribunal has been much more deferential to the member states than the European Court of Justice, which is a famously um, a teleologically kind of expansive court. Uh, they've been much less uh, willing to they'll hold governments to account to what the law requires, but they will not push them further. They're not, the Andean judges are not expansionist lawmakers. Uh, and they have also respected the third point, the space that Andean law gives to national judges to uh, apply Andean rules to the facts. They haven't pushed national judges to be strong partners in, in politically fraught compliance cases. There are some exceptions to that. Karen will talk about a few in a moment. Uh, but they've, in other words, allowed more space for politics within a legal system. Um, and the kind of formalism of their rulings, the narrow structure, the technical nature of their issues, has helped this tribunal survive in times that I think Karen and I would probably agree um, would, would have swamped the ability of another tribunal to, to continue to operate and succeed. So let me turn things over to Karen to talk about larger lessons learned and um, maybe also uh, future research too. So this is how we tried to unpack what was going on in the Andean system, was to answer these very Andean-specific questions. But again, we're interested in the Andean Tribunal as a model of a transplanted international court. So when we then draw the lessons, they're about international courts in developing country context. So one thing that we can say is that effective international courts can exist outside of Europe. And as the scholars were developing all these theories about international courts based on the European models, others were saying, hey, wait a second. Europe is Europe, and the rest of the world is the rest of the world. Okay, well, in this Andean system, by any plausible definition, this court is effective in, in the realm of intellectual property. It adjudicates thousands of cases. It is still receiving 500 cases a year. Actually, the caseload is really going up. Um, so it is, it is successful, but it's been successful by adapting to its local context. So we do a lot of presentations in Europe, and Europe is often like wants a very maximalist court. 
They want a court that has the most open design, the most power, that has an expansionist lawmaking uh, component. And that's not going to work in a developing country context. So they can succeed in Europe, but they're going to have to find a different strategy to do so. Also, in looking at all of these cases, we can see that not international courts can be active without being activist. This tribunal is not activist. It's not an expansionist lawmaker. It has had opportunities. Litigants have brought it cases and said, why don't you interpret the law expansively? And every time the court says, no, we're not going to do this. We will enforce the letter of the law. But when they, even in surprising contexts, they have said, we're not going to um, in, push member states. So in the early Andean period, Andean integration started in the 60s, and the court was added in the 80s. And in the 60s, they had this gigantic loophole to their free trade program, which was called this list of exceptions. And it was said of the list of exceptions that everything they actually traded was on the list of exceptions, and everything they didn't trade was not on the list of exceptions. So early cases said to the court, you should start to rule on whether it's validly in the list of exceptions. You should start to limit what they can do on the list of exceptions. And the Indian Tribunal said, no. The list of exceptions, that's for member states to determine. And in that realm, they can do whatever they want. And so in, in our work, we draw a direct analog to the, the Van Hind and Moos case, which is a famous case of the European Court of Justice, where the court said exactly the opposite. Even though it looks like this is an area that national Country, governments and judiciary should have their own rule. We're not going to follow that. So in many of examples, the court says we're not going to be an expansionist lawmaker. But also by not expanding, then litigants stop bringing cases that could expand the law. Um, and so when we started to compare why was the European court so expansionist, why is the Andean court not so expansionist, uh, I went back to my earlier research on the European court and found this important role for jurist advocacy movements. And I'm happy to explain more of what, what we mean by that. But when you have a movement that is backing the international court, they're much more able to be expansionist. But we also found not being expansionist, being very politically prudent, has a lot of virtues. We also found that national judges are not the only or even the essential compliance partners. It really is this relationship with national administrative agencies that is so central to the Andean legal system. And Larry mentioned this new development where uh, national agencies can go directly to the Andean court and to bypass national judges. And he also mentioned that in around 1996, they changed the Andean legal system and allowed individuals to go directly to the Andean tribunal for non-compliance cases. Both of these changes are because national courts are not very good compliance partners. And so they want to give litigants a way around having to go through national courts. No one has a lot of confidence in the national courts which is also how the Andean Tribunal built its IP rule of law island. The litigants and the agencies have much more confidence in the Andean Tribunal than they have in their own national courts. So that was a surprise for us. We expected national judges to be the linchpin. I had written in many cases, national judges are the linchpin of a supranational legal system. Not true. Not just in the Andean context, but I think in a developing country context. When national judges are weak and their position is precarious, they're going to be legal formalists, and they're not going to be able to carry the, um, the adventurous load of making kind of iconoclastic rulings. We also had to find new ways to assess, um, assess IC effectiveness. And both of us had been scholars writing on what makes courts effective. And the original point of view is if their rulings are followed, then they're effective. And by that definition, the Indian Tribunal is tremendously effective because all of its intellectual property rulings are followed completely. Okay? But compliance is not going to be enough of a measure. So we had to come up with other ways of thinking whether or not the court was effective. So in intellectual property, we looked both at activation and building partnerships and eliciting state compliance. So the, the ruling on second use patents that Larry explained is an example where the national judges chose to follow the Andean Tribunal rather than following domestic law, even though they were then not applying a law that had been intentionally passed in order to circumvent Andean law. Okay, so we started to measure effectiveness by activation, by tight relationships with compliance partners, and by the ability to um, elicit state respect for legal rules, even in cases where they don't really want to follow the legal rules. We also have a chapter in this book where we process trace. We look at these disputes involving cigarettes, involving alcohol, and these major economic hard times cases, mega politics cases where the economies are in major crisis. 
And we look at how litigants use, by tracing the, the dispute, we can see how they use both preliminary rulings, non-compliance procedures, challenges to the validity of Andean decisions. They're using all of these mechanisms to try to get to a legal outcome that they want, not always successfully because the secretary and the court will say, no, we don't want to be an expansionist lawmaker. But we came up with other ways to think about whether or not international courts are effective. We also then looked at how Andean tribunals um, navigate politically hard times. Truth being told, in this book, we thought we would collect what were all these articles we published based on data through 2007 and move on. This book took us years longer than we thought because it gave us an opportunity to just focus on this crisis period, which had already begun at the end of our research. You know, our research was through 2007, Venezuela withdraws in 2006. So we knew things were changing, but we had no way to say what was changing because all of our data was older. So we started over for the seven year period and we looked at what then happened. And um, we found that the way that the Andean Tribunal navigates these incredible political turbulence is to let the political branches define the pace and scope of Andean integration. So member states decided to abrogate the common external tariff. They decided not to even use it anymore. And as long as they pass that through a legal procedure, the Andean Tribunal is fine. You can abrogate that. Um, and in numerous examples, they say if member states will make a, a legal corrective, collective decision to allow Peru to opt out of Andean of the free trade area for 10 years, if they decide collectively, we'll let them do that. They have allies who will support the international court. This tight alliance with intellectual property agencies is never wavering. This political turbulence is going on with respect to Andean integration, but the compliance partners are very strong. And that's also how they survive. But they also protect the rule of law by enforcing clear international rules, even when the decision is unpopular. They say, if you, don't, if you want to change Andean law, go ahead and change it. But you have to do it through the legal procedures. And if you don't do that, we're still going to enforce it. And there's one case involving pesticides where they keep pushing Peru and they keep pushing Peru. And eventually, they Peru gets the Andean community to change the Andean law. Um, and so it does uphold the rule of law, but it lets member states choose to exit the system. We've been continuing this research because we like collaborating together so much um, in a number of ways. We've started to look in Africa, where there are other transplants. In Africa, the courts have moved into human rights, but they have no economic cases, even though their primary mandate involves economic cases. So we have this article looking at how the ECOWAS court gained, gained a human rights jurisdiction. We've done then through i courts this expansive project on how context shapes the authority of international courts. We published a special issue in Law and Contemporary Problems. And a book's going to come out in 2018. It has 13 international courts and a framework for thinking about variable authority of international courts. And we've always been interested separately in backlash. And now we've been studying backlash together against uh, courts in Africa. But I want to stop now so that there's plenty of time for questions. So I'm happy to open up at anything you see here that might have stimulated it, but further questions about what our research was, implications, anything, we're happy to. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there is um, budget allocations with, within the Andean community for all of these community courts, I mean, in each of the communities, they have a budget allocation. Um, there's a, that is often hard fought over, in, and uh, countries that are poor often pay much less. Uh, so there's that. That's the sort of core budget. It's not enough. I mean, if you were to see the building that the court is is in, it's it's not especially impressive. Um, they also have um, gotten infusions of funds from the European Union, which of course, is interested in seeing these copied institutions thrive. So uh, they provided technical support and as well as financial support, some training for judges. So that provides a, a fair amount of additional uh, revenue. Um, so the operational expenses are covered within the community. And the European money allows them to do extra things, like put their all their decisions online, like convene workshops uh, with national judges. And that's right. And so so it's, a, it's a hybrid, but most of the money comes internally, which means the implication of that is the tribunal can be starved of resources um, when the member states so decide. 
And interestingly, the effectiveness, even in that technical area of intellectual property, means that there are stakeholders who want the court to survive. And so for the governments, if the court was doing nothing, it would be very easy to kill um, and get rid of the judges. But it's doing something in an area where at least some firms and lobbying groups have an interest in having it continue. And so even when there have been attempts to say, maybe we should re-examine the jurisdiction of this court or cut it back, or it hasn't succeeded in part because there are stakeholders who support it. You said the anti-community eliminated its parliament. And at the time, they That's said, the should we eliminate the parliament and the court? And all that got eliminated was the parliament. In, that, uh, in the white shirt? Uh, Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's absolutely true, and you know, I did, we didn't spend as much time talking about why there aren't as many trade cases, uh, other than to say that some of the most significant disputes are between the member states, one or more member state, and China, the European Union, the U.S. Right. So, um, uh, and also there is a pull within South America, right, to um, within the Mercosur countries, which have uh, um, a structure called open regionalism, right, which lets certain states collaborate with other um, uh, multi uh, regional organizations. So the answer is that the Andean community has, on this point, followed the letter of Andean law and essentially said, in the absence of you know some change to Andean law. Andean rules are supreme over bilateral agreements and over multilateral agreements if there is a direct and clear conflict with Andean law. Now, at the same time, they then let the member states amend Andean law to allow a bilateral to go forward. So there has been some, a little bit of weakening in some of the trade area when uh, Peru and Colombia entered into the bilateral free trades with the United States. They had to amend Andean law to do that. Um, they didn't amend Andean law in all of its particulars, but enough to avoid what they thought were the most significant challenges. And that was because of this pre-existing doctrine that said, you know, Andean law is the highest law, even above multilateral or bilateral. We should say that decision is why the, the Peru, Colombia, is why Venezuela left. And we have a chapter in the book that is it's too complicated to explain now, but there's an epic case going on with Ecuador and Correa that could have broken the entire Andean community. And there's all of these political moves to build this regional system called UNASUR and to, to sublimate the Andean community to it. And we explain these parallel strategies where Ecuador is trying to avoid non, a non-compliance case by sublimating the Andean community. That's when they get rid of the parliament. That's when Ecuador tries to get rid of the court. And is playing this very high politics game but what ends up happening to it, as far as we can tell, is that the case transfers into the WTO. And it transfers into the WTO because Equ the level of protection that Ecuador needed, it's a dollar economy, it just couldn't get enough from discriminating against Peru and Colombia. That was not going to solve its problems. It needed to discriminate against the European Union, China, and the United States. And then it transferred into the WTO, and that actually probably may saved, saved may have saved the system because it just wasn't worth the fight to dismantle the Andean community when Ecuador needed so much more. It's all explained in detail. Yeah. Right. So, to what extent is the second world group question really triggered, given 
Can I, can I give a? Yeah, sure, sure. So on the, on the IP story, they're actually constantly changing intellectual property law. But they're changing it by redrafting the law. By getting the agencies, the, the ending community goes to the agencies and says, how should we change this law? Which, you know, it's, it's not surprising that they change. It was a very new set of rules. And as they're working it out, they find these problems. And they find they, these ways in which they need to clarify it. But they put all of the changes into the law itself. And they put it in a way that national agencies were involved in the process and then had a stake in trying to enforce it. So they used the legal formalism with intellectual property. But there was not the same kind of political will to change Andean law in the same way. Let me just tell you a minute about this. In other case. areas. In, in, in other areas. Let me just tell you for a second about this pesticides case, which was when Andean officials got very enthusiastic about regulating the environmental uh, consequences of pesticides. And they did, during the Washington consensus period, get strong Andean rules. And then the participants went about enforcing these Andean rules. But enforcing these rules would have meant that basically Monsanto could be fully sold, but any other kind of pesticide could not. And so it, it really shored up the, the power of the Western chemical companies. And so Peru wanted to not follow the law. And, and it tried to just ignore the Andean court. And the case came back three times, the same litigants. First, Peru loses. Second, Peru, you're not implementing. Third, if you don't implement this, we're going to ask for national-based remedies. And the court says, go ahead and give them national-based remedies. Then the member states change the law. So they're, they're, it's the same strategy, but with different substantive outcomes. So the only thing I would add to that, Matt, is that the coalitions have not had, in other words, to push for jurisprudential boldness, because they can get through the political economy what they want in the, in the legislative process. So there, there is the ferment there, but it's actually pretty easy to, with four countries to make these legislative changes. So they do it that way, and then they get those rules in force. And when there are bold pushes outside of intellectual property, the court has rejected them. Yeah, Neil. You have, two, you have two things. We've had this conversation before, Neil, and I think it's a really interesting question. One thing that I, my prior answer to you in part was, you know, make sure you understand who your allies are, right? Um, in a system like this where you're creating, right, uh, a rule of law, I think that's more germane than in a situation where maybe the rule of law, you know, is, is beginning to weaken. So I think what in part has helped the court to survive is when individual judges, and there have been a few of them, have gone outside of the courtroom and talked about the values of the law and the legal system and what can be lost by not um, you know, adhering to those values. It doesn't always work, but I, it's, I'm struck not just in this court, but in many of these developing country courts the extent to which judges are extrajudicial entrepreneurs of the rule of law. And we don't generally think about our own judges right doing that. I mean, they give speeches at the Federal Society or the American Constitution Society. But they, they don't kind of explain to people on the street in, in some ways what, why the rule of law matters or why it might matter. And I think there might need to be more of an understanding of why a court is different than an ordinary political institution. Now, that's a little bit of a paradox, right? Because I'm saying judges should go outside of the judicial role to explain why they should, there should be judges. Nevertheless, that does seem to be a trend that we're seeing in a number of these other courts.
But you also see this, this relationship between what national judges can do and what the international system can do. So I said that they, they try to circumvent the national judges for a set of cases. And that's because the national judges are not strong. Some, partly they don't know the technicalities of the law, but they're also not politically strong enough, especially by the time Ecuador has replaced its entire Supreme Court. So there's some decisions in the 90s where the Ecuadorian Supreme Court says, you must follow Andean law, and actually strikes down a number of government decisions. But that's not going to happen anymore in 1996, because the entire court, or 2006, the entire court's been replaced okay, um, in a populist move. And at that point, the case is then transferred to the Andean level, where the government can't control the court as significantly. In the US, we don't have, thank God, yet, you know, this I'm going to I'm going to replace the entire court. But this is going on in populist countries. I mean, in Hungary, they just lowered the retirement age to 65, and there went 60% of the judges. And so they find, they find other ways to do it. And so you, you find that the fate of the rule of law domestically and internationally are very interlinked. And so I do worry about the American system where they say, Somehow we don't have to follow international law, as if you think that that's not going to spill over into this. You get to choose when you follow the law and when you don't follow the law. You, you need to uphold a rule of law mentality. That doesn't mean that you have to have law replacing politics, and that's what the Andean Tribunal does. It enforces very clear law, even when it's politically unpopular, and then says to the political branches, you don't like it, then change the law. Um, so the legal formalism helps, but I think that the two levels of the international and domestic and, and upholding the rule of law in both is really important. Um, Guy? By which you mean economic development? Yeah. Well, I think the IP balance, um, this regional court does more to balance, I'm out of my domain here, you'll, you'll correct right. me, more to balance the development needs and intellectual property than um, countries on their own could do with the political pressure of the TRIPS plus agreement. So we looked at second use patents in the Andean context and they did not allow them, but in other Latin American countries they were allowed. So this became a way to protect uh, the region. I have to say, though, that's not a huge victory because what we also found in Colombia was that they changed the health regulations for generic um, producers, and, and half of the generic producers closed down. Okay, so they couldn't use the TRIPS Plus law, but they, the pharmaceutical companies found and another, another way, way to yeah. do it. But um, we have to say that in, in the African context, where the courts are not enforcing the economic rules, it's because of development needs in this free trade is not really going to lead them to development. There's kind of a collusion where everybody agrees we're not just going to enforce these rules. But in human rights becomes an area where the courts can make a difference. So I was surprised to learn for the ECOWAS system, even though it ostensibly is all about regional integration. That's why it was founded. That's what all of its rules do. If you take a very formalist approach, you would think this institution is failing tremendously because it's not a common market. But yet in the realm of security, and in the realm of human rights, this community is doing a lot. And so by letting them on paper have one thing, but in reality pursue the goals that they collectively want to pursue is how they further development. I think we're essentially out of time. We're happy to take questions afterward. Um, if anyone's really interested, not that we expect it, there are, we'll be signing books outside. Um, so thank you very much all for coming.